as a kid, it's, I certainly, it wasn't conscious. It's so unconscious, right? It's where you just want to fit in. You want to have a story that maybe sounds like what's out there in media, right? It's like you want to be like everybody else because there's this sense of belonging that every single person wants. And, and there's something about the lack of story that makes one feel invisible or you just don't have that sense of belonging, right? And that may seem really small, but man, you know, to me that, that filters into every aspect of every human being, you know, because it affects all your choices at the end of the day. Um, and it's very powerful on the flip side, right? So not being down on it, it's like, you know, embracing one's story or understanding that every person's story matters. That's Baycat's mission. That's like our vision. That the, that's what we say to these kids, that every person's story matters. These kids' stories matter today. Um, hopefully that's a starting place and you go, okay, that's super cool um, because there is something about who I am, uniquely who I am, that then matters. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network. I'm so excited you're joining me today. I just had an amazing conversation with a woman who is absolutely changing the world around her and changing the worlds of so many people who are changing the world through story. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, she is a the founder, the president and CEO of an organization called Baycat. Her name is Vili Wong, and Vili is absolutely killing it when it comes to video storytelling. Baycat is an organization that helps uh, underserved youth uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, and help them learn how to tell better stories, learn how, how to tell their own story, and specifically using the video medium and everything that goes with that, you know, filmmaking, television, uh, the music that goes with that, writing, production, everything that goes along with video. That's what Baycat is teaching these kids. It's absolutely amazing. So here's how it Here's how, it, how it's read off of uh, their website. Vili had a crazy dream to create a new kind of social enterprise that helps kids who, like her, grew up in the projects. Raised by an immigrant single mother in New York City, City Vili's desire to tell her story forged a passion for using the digital media arts to capture stories untold and to create social change. And that is absolutely huge. It is I can't, I just, I'm going to let you listen to the, to the interview because it is amazing. She is a, a TED speaker. She uh, is a, a mentor to so many kids. She has an amazing story herself and we just talk about it all. We talk a little bit about video storytelling, about storytelling in general, the power of story and her goal is to use storytelling to end racism one story at a time. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. So had a great conversation with Billy. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as we get started into today's conversation, please remember go to the storytellersnetwork.com for more resources for past episodes, for past seasons, uh, to help you tell your story just a little bit better and maybe make the world a better place through story. Now, let's get to the stories. <music> So thank you, Vili Wang, for joining me today on the Storytellers Network. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you. How are you today? I'm very well. I'm very well. Excellent. It's good to be here. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for making time. I know you've got a busy schedule with uh, some stuff going on that we talked about earlier, but um, but yeah, glad to have you here. So I like to uh, to kind of find out where everyone is. Um, my idea is that I'm I'm in Southwest Michigan in a small town, and I'm a storyteller. You can be one anywhere. So let's start with that, Vili. Where where are you? I am in a beautiful production uh, room, as you can see from the background, and we are located in the dog patch of San Francisco, which is, you know, nobody ever knew where that was before, but it is the up and coming or actually already coming uh, neighborhood that is filled with uh, 
a lot of uh, tech companies, design companies, uh, used to be uh, part of like Butcher Town, not too far from here. We're steps away actually from uh, one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So that plays a part, I know, in what we're going to talk about, like where you are and, and how you reach out to folks. So we'll get to that. I'd like to to reference so that the TED Talk, I mentioned that you have a TED Talk in the intro. Um, and in there, you mentioned being a storyteller and empowering others to tell stories. And that's all about Baycat then. Um, so tell me a little bit about Baycat and let the listeners know kind of where you're coming from as a storyteller with that. Yeah, I I never really thought of myself as a storyteller. So even being called that, I'm still kind of getting used to that. (laughs) But aren't we all natural storytellers, right? I feel like it anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a kid who grew up in the hood in New York, I was not from San Francisco, but I think um, growing up uh, working in the sweatshops and growing up poor, uh, you know, not seeing stories like ours in media, Um, or really when you think about it, even growing up with an immigrant mom, you know, the, she never really read to me and partly because we didn't have books in her native language, um, that were available for her to read to me. So like that art of story really was about oral history and, and storytelling, right? Orally, which I feel like is one of those things in our barrage of media these days that we kind of forget about, you know, that it's just that you're sitting at a table or you're sitting on the couch and you're just telling a story, you know? Um, so my mom, I would say was definitely very much, a, 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 you know, the, the inspiration for me to, to maybe look at that a little more closely. Um, but, you know, that idea of our young people's voices, uh, just like mine, I felt like it didn't seem that my story really mattered because at some level, my mom didn't believe that her story mattered, you know, being the single mom, immigrant, et cetera. Um, so not being represented, this, I think, as I got into what media, the media world is, or really corporate America and, and being out there, um, getting the education that, and, and being able to speak, you know, English, et cetera, and really being a citizen of this country, um, it became pretty clear, not so much like the stories that are out there, but more what are the stories that are not being told or not being distributed? You know, how come we don't see or hear stories like ours or that art of telling story even, you know, gener- intergenerationally? So I think with that void, that really was the Kickstarter. And thinking about, you know, but how are our perceptions made of each other? You know, you get to learn about somebody, especially when they break down and they tell you a story, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what's on their LinkedIn. It's really like what's behind. Um, So with that, and given my long, uh, my many careers, my story, um, I, you know, why I want to start BayCat, which stands for Bayview Hunters Point Center for Arts and Tech, um, is really to provide access and opportunity to discover the storytellers of today and to give them those tools, because story is not just a hypothetical, right, anymore. People make money, obviously, in the movie industry, media industry, those are your typical ways of making money from story. But just like our young people who are growing up today, maybe coming from a different background, if their stories are not represented out there, then guess what? There's a whole work track. There's a whole industry that therefore does not become theirs. I'd like to say like, you know, I kind of grew up thinking I am meant to consume media. I'm meant to consume stories, right? But I am not the creator of stories. So Baycat represents this place where we wanted to work with young people coming from one of the historically, you know, underserved neighborhoods here in San Francisco, which is Baby Hunters Point, and give young people the tools and access to become the storytellers of today. Not like tomorrow, I'm too impatient. Like it's not <laughs> the children are the future, you know. They're, they're the now, they're storytellers now. Um, so Baycat is this place where we have this academy and we have free classes actually, you know, we have 30 something kids today. Uh, so if you hear somebody screaming, that, that's gonna be them. Uh, but uh, it's their first day, they probably won't scream. <laughs> but we got uh, young people who come in and they are learning all the digital media arts for free, learning to be storytellers. But we've actually created this pathway to employment because we also have this studio. And our studio has this ability to create great stories for paying clients like the Golden State Warriors or Super Bowl 50 
or the National Park Service or Pixar. So when we get employed and um, as a studio and your kid coming from this poor neighborhood and all of a sudden you're, you're outfitted with like a, a pr professional studio, all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is yours. And there's actually a path. If you want to be a creator of story, there's actually a way for you to do that and stay in this industry. So that's what that became. That's amazing. I, I love that idea yeah. of empowering them today, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you mentioned something, Billy, there that I, I picked up on. You said that you, you thought you felt like you were meant to be a consumer of the media, not a creator. But you also mentioned earlier that when you looked at things out there, you looked at stories, no one told your story. How hard is that to be a consumer and to be feel to feel like you're forced to be a consumer when none of the stories are about they, they don't look like you, they don't sound like you, they're not they're not your background. That has to be difficult. Yeah, you know, I, I'm old enough to know, like, you know, back in the day when the television set was almost like this, we had like one of those <laughs> old TVs or like this. Yep. And there wasn't 600 channels and there weren't, you know, there wasn't that kind of access. So, you know, I think it's that feeling, I don't know, it's hard to describe if you've never felt invisible, um, but that's probably the best way as I look back, you know, um, uh, even today, I would say in media, you know, when you look at it's great, we've got Black Panther, you know, box office hits, we've got our first black president who turned out, you know, there's a lot of African American stories that are out there that have been put out there. I still see like Asian American and Chinese American, my particular story and kinds of story, you don't really see as much. So even to this day, there's still, I would say, you know, not as many stories. I don't know, it's a hard thing to talk about volume right? It's, I, I kind of think of it like, you know, once upon a time, if there were no stories in America, um, you know, that were about, that were coming from voices like ours. And now maybe there's a little more, and maybe in the spectrum of looking at different cultures and ethnicities, there have been improvements. My question is like, how many decades of being a consumer, right, have been out there? And to the extent we're slowly flipping the the script or the switch and saying, okay, well, how many impressions, um, how many stories do you need to hear of a Chinese, you know, kid growing up in the hood to maybe change your view of what it is that I could accomplish, right? Or, and so if I was a kid and I never saw that before, other than looking and listening to my mother's story and those people around us, and what were we doing? Working in the, in the factory, we were working in the sweatshop. So if that was the only story that I felt was actually told and that I knew about, there's that invisibility from the outside world, but then there's also the shaping of who I was supposed to be, right? And then, of course, you get into, I think, a lot of the, when you're the consumer and a lot of the messaging that's out there and look at also how we've developed for young women was always, you know, you're going to you're not going to be the doctor, the lawyer, you're going to be a housewife, go get married. Where's your Prince Charming, right? All the women stereotypes that are out there. So, you know, as a kid, I know I, I want to be like everybody else. I want to fit in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's like, as a kid, it's, I certainly, it wasn't conscious. It's so unconscious, right? It's where you just want to fit in. You want to have a story that maybe sounds like what's out there in media right? It's like you want to be like everybody else because there's this sense of belonging that every single person wants. And, and there's something about the lack of story that makes one feel invisible or you just don't have that sense of belonging, right? And that may seem really small, but man, you know, to me that, that filters into every aspect of every human being, you know, because... It affects all your choices at the end of the day. Um, and it's very powerful on the flip side, right? So not being down on it, it's like, you know, embracing one's story or understanding that every person's story matters. That's Baycat's mission. That's like our vision. That the, that's what we say to these kids, that every person's story matters. These kids' stories matter today. Um, hopefully that's a starting place and you go, okay, that's super cool. Um, because there is something about who I am, uniquely who I am, that then matters. Yeah. If that if that rings a bell. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I and I love the idea that because so you know I'm I'm a I'm, I'm a guy obviously. I'm a, I'm a, hi guy. <laughs> hi. I'm a 
I'm a middle class, middle aged, straight white guy from the Midwest, right? Pretty standard. I never really thought about this growing up. Um, and, and, I, and I was in a, I grew up in a town, great hometown, but very much everybody looked like me. And so I never thought about the invisibility of, of folks like this. And now that I have, actually, I have daughters. I have a, a 12 and a 13 year old, nice. um, both girls. And so now as, as a dad of daughters, I see that in a, in a different microcosm. I mean, obviously we're, we're still all, we're still all white. My, my wife is also Caucasian. Um, we're a very European American family, <laughs> but anyway, but like that, that female side of it, I see that now so much more and it really has interested me. And that was one of the biggest things, the biggest draws to invite you on Billy was the idea that hearing those invisible stories, I, I just, I've had my eyes open over the last few years and I just want to do that. So, so thank you for that. Um, that's huge. Well, it's, it's great that you see that. And, and part of it is, you know, people's experiences. It's like, you know, if, if that's what it took for you to also have daughters and to like, again, I, I'd love to interview you and your life changes and what, <laughs> what motivates you about story. Right. Um, but like, there's obviously a passion that you have for that and you honor therefore your daughter's stories. Right. Um, and, and what is it that they get to grow up with these days and the role models that are out there? It's certainly many, many more than when I grew up way back when, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're headed in the right direction. And certainly, you know, this kind of um, forum that you have, uh, this network that you're building too, to, to really get these stories out there, I think are part of that next step. Well, thank you. Um, so... Uh, Speaking of that kind of that direction, everything else, and 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 every every person's story matters. On your website, that's one of your threads throughout it. And help end racism one story at a time. Yes. That that really hit me. So how can we how can we use story to end racism? Yeah. So I mean, racism is such a huge right. It's a big word. Right. It encompasses so many emotions in addition to like, just if you study the history of what that is, um, there's probably not one element of our lives where, you know, race isn't part of a conversation, right? From music, we, right, right before we, we started recording, we were talking about music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just all those influences. So, um, you know, our mission to end racism one story at a time and how do you do that through story is I think it, part of what we're trying to teach young people to do is to be authentic in who they are, right? Part of that engagement and what we call empowerment, I think it's about really engaging young people exactly where they are or engaging you or engaging me exactly where we are, being our authentic self. And if there's a way that we could tell story authentically, because when you look at like mass media now, there's a lot more movies around different cultures, African-American culture, the Latino culture, you know, how much of it is like Hollywood-esque, a narrative that's kind of out there that you've heard before, you know, there's a really powerful piece that we did at the end of last year with our young people. And these are like teenagers to young adults to even our board chair, who's a grown man. And we were talking about now, so this is end of 2000, you know, just, just uh, last year, um, that we were talking about like, how do you feel represented or misrepresented in media today? And what was scary to me were the words coming out of, out of our young people's mouths. Um, there was like a mini me, <laughs> you know, what, what a young uh, Chinese American young woman who still says like, she feels like a secondary character in somebody else's life you know, or a young African-American male in that, in that sequence, Isaiah, who talks about, he's just trying to get to school and people look at him and they think he's an animal, right? Mm -hmm. the, the burdens that our kids, the stereotypes that our kids are still growing up with, right? So where does that come from, right, Dan? It's like how, I thought we were already, we got a black president in office, like I said, right? We did. So we're done why, with racism. We're good, are right? Are we done? Right? So it just, <laughs> it, it's obviously that we, we're not done. And kind of going back to like what I was saying before, if once upon a time there were no stories about young black men, and then you see a whole bunch of stories that are about them as, you know, gang people or doing drugs or whatever that is, then does that shape people's impressions, especially if you grew up in a neighborhood where there are no black people, right? Just to say it up, say it out loud, right? Yeah. So then, whoa, so just like when people look at me, it's like, oh, you're Chinese. 
if you can't believe, like, this is how crazy it was when I was practicing as a lawyer and I got to go to my first event and I was actually in the Midwest, um, I was approached uh, at that point and I'm, you know, I got my law degree, I'm a practicing attorney, I'm in a room with all these other lawyers, not other, no, no other Chinese people, but I get the comments like, oh, hi, I'm introducing myself. How are you? I'm Billy Wong. Good to meet you. It's like, oh, oh, hi. And I get the nice handshake and they're looking at me and kind of with the, the little doe eyes. And it's like, wow, your English is so good. And I'm like, whoa. And, and I didn't know what to say at that moment with that little like caressing handshake there. And I'm like, and so is yours. Like, <laughs> I, what am I supposed to say? Yeah. So the question is like, what formed the opinion that my English wouldn't be good? Well, I, we could point to a lot that would say that, right? How many Chinese American are actually spoken as Chinese people? Or if you see Chinese people, they often have an accent, right? Sure. Is, an, is an accent bad, right? So when you get to it, it's like, man, how many thousands of stories, tens of thousands of stories have we each watched or taken in, whether we want to or not, commercials, right? Like again, going back to the consumer, whether we want it or not, even you are barraged with that. So how many, how many impressions, how many more stories is it gonna take to flip it? And it goes to how many stories are out there that are truly going back to authentic? So as a Chinese American woman, I have no, yeah, I have whatever. I might probably have a New York accent if you start pissing me off, right? <laughs> so it's like, what, what is the stereotype and why do we have these stereotypes? So to me, mm -hmm. every story that is out there that is authentic and especially like what we're interested in, is there a way to move this dial in media? Because what ends up getting portrayed in media, media tends to be that perpetuation, I think, of stereotypes that may be partly authentic. Who knows? Maybe part of it is based on some authentic story. But, you know, it's usually then exacerbated to one end. And so then you get these pictures, right, of people who don't become real. They're just not real. They're not authentic. Yeah. So our belief is, you know, there's a reason why I know I couldn't be authentic in a lot of ways. You know, um, when, when you do see the TED Talk, that was like one of the scariest things I ever did because I talked about a story that I never talked about before. And that was getting ripped off, right? And mugged by knife point. And that was scary. And, you know, my own racism, I think partly like every single person needs to look at who they are and where your own racism comes from and acknowledging that, you know, part of what I wanted to say was I was racist. That came from my language. That came from my culture. But it didn't come from the fact that some of my best friends were African-American. Mm. Those, going back to authenticity, that, you know, it's not like my best friend who's, who's African-American was like every other African-American or even some of the bad experiences I may have had. It's let's take this person for who they are. They're real. They're my best friend. This is, this is the stories we get to shape together, mm -hmm. right? So I think when you get down to our human nature and maybe how in some ways our brain wants to almost generalize because it's easier to manage, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the science of that side of it, but I do feel like, you know, what my love is and where I love and, and, you know, you know it when you hear a story and the little hairs go, <laughs> go up, right? To me, that's, that's when it's authentic. That's when you know there's something here. There's something that this person's telling me that's, that's getting into my, getting into my being. And hopefully what we believe is in every time that happens, that's going to help reshape how, how we each see people, you know, and maybe stop stereotyping and generalizing, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it's like, it's a, a stone thrown in the water. The, that ripple effect of storytelling to each other helps hopefully shape that. I, I agree. Yeah. So well, I, I want to go yeah. back to something I want to, um, but first I want to go back to the very beginning of our conversation when I said your name, I didn't even ask you how to pronounce it as a, as a, a Michigander. I went with the hard <laughs> A is it's Wong. Is that it's right? Wong. Yeah. Wong. Okay. So Wong, All right. Wong is actually a very important name because it's a, it's a, it's, um, 
in Chinese in Mandarin, it's uh, the word for king. Oh, okay. So I, I always joke around when I see a kid who might be his, his or her last name might be King, MLK, Martin Luther King. Uh, we're actually, so it's the same last name. It's Wong. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Very cool. So, so, so now I, I, now that I have that good, um, I got my Thank Midwestern you. accent out of the way. Um, <laughs> you mentioned stereotypes. So, so when that person came to you and said, oh, your English is so good. Stereotypes, I, I, I think quite often, as you said, start off quite with our experiences, right? Yeah. We, 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 they're shaped by that. So stereotypes in and of themselves aren't inherently bad, but how we use them is bad. Like, is that kind of right? Yeah, I think it's more like how we use them can be bad, right? Yeah. Because if, if, for example, and as think, you know, whether it's unconscious bias that's being taught now in the workplace, et cetera, mm. if that stereotype doesn't even get me an interview for a job, then definitely the opportunity that I would have is different than an opportunity that you might have, despite your Midwestern beautiful accent, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, that's where it's not the stereotype in and of itself. It definitely is about how it's used mm -hmm. and how we, how we interact with each other. Like how many missed opportunities, there's no way to measure, right? May, may I not have had, or your daughters, just because they're girls, mm -hmm. right? Um, or like, I remember um, I wanted to play the saxophone when I was in, um, you know, uh, junior high school, they call that in, in New York City, not middle <laughs> schools. Um, and they were like, oh, you're a girl, girls don't play saxophones. And I didn't even have like somebody to point to, to say, you know, the Simpsons were on yet. <laughs> so oh, man, they were good like, point. <laughs> right? There were yeah. no like women saxophone players. So I don't know why I was compelled. I want to play saxophone. And they're like, no, no, no. Girls play the flute. I'm like, I'm not interested in the flute. <laughs> like, no, thank you. It's like, okay, well maybe you could play the clarinet, clarinet, right? Great. What the heck is the difference between, uh, you know, we're, we're in the woodwind family and a clarinet and a saxophone. Really, where did that come from? Right. Just because women didn't really play saxophones? I don't know. Yeah. So, of course, I ended up showing them because I became concert master mistress, or that doesn't sound right either. I was the woman of the concert. Uh, and, uh, and then just later on got my own saxophone. That's right. Awesome. So, like, got to prove it to them. But Absolutely. I think to your point, you know, about the stereotypes. And I think what is really interesting to think about these days is how, you know, how does story and authenticity story and the flip side of like looking at stereotypes come into play every single day in marketing and business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at the corporate world, um, everybody's about their brand. Everybody is about, hey, we're the good guys. Look at us. We, we care about community. We care about you. And therefore we want to sell you this thing, right? <laughs> Um, and people are becoming much more color conscious, right? It's like, you're going to see the brown and black person. You're going to see the woman. You're going you're gonna to see the, maybe the Asian American, the Chinese person in, in, in the commercial spot. But going back to like, does it perpetuate a stereotype? Does it, is it authentic? Um, those are kind of the, I think, the deeper questions to ask and yeah. to say, okay, what is it that we're trying to do here? Um, again, selling a product or a service is not, of course, something bad in and of itself. Um, we all need to know what's out there. But there is this movement, I feel like, that's around looking at race to people's advantage for marketing purposes. And whether it's to break a stereotype in that way or to perpetuate one, it's kind of an interesting you know, place to be looking at, I think, in, um, in the corporate sector. Well, there's a lot of power behind it as, as media Absolutely. creators. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. And, I, and I guess my thought is, you know, I, and I have had this conversation with, um, with uh, African-American friends of mine or, or other folks who are on a, in a, just a different world than I am. And, and, I, and I used to hear the term white privilege and think that it was immediate, immediately negative, that I was take advantage of the privilege and, and I didn't let anybody else or whatever. And so then I, 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 I have begun to expand that obviously and think about that. And I, and I think the same thing comes with stereotypes is that it almost seems like this, the person who believes a stereotype without ever realizing that it's not real, isn't doing it out to, isn't always doing it out of, um, out of a negative place. Right. So, so once you're educated, once you're kind of awakened to that, 
to the idea that there are other stories out there. It's then it's on our responsibility then to help break down those stereotypes and tell those stories and share that, you know, whatever ethnicity you have, whatever race you, you are, yeah. um, you know, cause, cause I think of this quite often as when, when you hear the term racism, I very personally think, gosh, that must be, you know, white people against everybody else. And that's just, I mean, what you said earlier about, about your own racism from your culture, like you don't think about that. And so I think it's so important to share those stories. So I don't, I don't have yeah. a question that I just, <laughs> I no, just like, no. I love the idea of, of yeah. that, of helping people see that. Well, I think it's a, it's a tough thing. It, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to like, look at yourself and go, okay, why, what am I do? How am I judging this person ahead of time or even by their name or whatever those identity are, the identity factors are right. Mm -hmm. That, um, that trigger us. And of course the triggers are, are so psychologically deep or emotional sometimes. Um, you know, it's like, there's so many parts of that. So I'm glad there's more of a, a conscious effort now in the workplace to, to say, these are important things to look at. Are you conscious of your own biases, right? Um, it is implicit in a lot of ways. And I think just like fessing up to it and going, hey, I'm, I'm human and I'm not perfect. And I do, you know, I'll have stereotypes about Chinese people, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but, you know, I, you, 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 it's like you have to teach yourself. It does start with the I and not trying to say, hey, you're white and therefore, right? Or I'm Chinese and therefore, right? There's, it's like you're saying there, you know, racism is, is definitely, um, you know, not, what is it called? Not colorblind, right? right? It's like, it's not gender blind. I mean, we all have pieces of that ism in our bloodstream. Um, so it's like, how can we become aware of what, what, what it is and how it is affects us? Um, and I think, you know, for, for people who may not feel represented in media going back to like how our kids are feeling um, in that short that we created that I was telling you about, uh, you know, part I think of the solution is, is that we, we are hoping to offer is to say, you know, you don't, you have a choice. You don't have to live in that place. You don't have to be that person that feels like you have to be only the consumer because your voice does matter. And yeah, like find that part of you where you want to express yourself and you want to make your statements and you want to tell your stories, you know? And when you see what our kids create, it's really so inspiring because it's not just about, let me tell you about my race. You know, they do mockumentaries, they do satires, they do documentary films, they do music videos. Um, do they all have like a social justice element to it? Absolutely. And I think that's partly because we make this place a safe place to talk about it, right? Because it kind of goes to like, Dan, yeah. if you're talking to yourself half the time and you're like, okay, am I being racist? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, hey, I, I'm totally cool. Or I could say that. It's like, I'm totally cool. I'm multicultural. I have friends everywhere. But when do you, like, do you have hard discussions, you know, with some, with some friends where things are uncomfortable? Um, we get to do that with our kids. Like, this is a safe place where if they are having a hard day or something is going on, you, you kind of need your people. You need your people to be able to talk and to relate to how you're feeling because those feelings are important um, and to work through them. It's not like you also want to erase them because they're quite real, mm -hmm. right? So going back to like, if you feel these stereotypes and, and you're feeling them, whatever, for whatever trigger things are happening and, and this incident happens, who do you talk to about it? And you know, is it like, oh man, here we go. It's just a racist society. And this is always going to happen. Yeah. And do you stop? Right. And, and I feel like, I hope we're in this time where we could go beyond that. And I loved what you yeah. said, Dan, about like being, as we say, like woke, right. If you're, if you get that, we could, we all have some responsibility or we have an ability to help people see a different part, you know, a different, a different mm -hmm you know, different kind of world that we could all be in where we could be more accepting and belonging to each other. And here's an amazing story I want to share with you, right? Like how many people share positive stories that break down stereotypes is, mm -hmm. is my other answer. My other question, yeah. right? We're look at the fast, amazing, crazy that happens on social media. Um, you know, with, with some of the latest things about racial insults of one of the most powerful women 
in, in the White House recently and all about race, right? And looked at mm-hmm. what happened. So that exploded. Um, and I think it's because of the controversy, the conflict, and in a way, look at the outcome that happened after that, right? And, mm-hmm. and of course, everybody has an opinion about whether that was right or wrong. But in the end, it's like, what is it that we're doing to ourselves as a society? Does that kind of thing perpetuate the racism that's out there? How many positive retweets have you done, right? right. Or have I done, right? How many shares mm-hmm. of like really powerful stories um, do we actually pay more attention to? And I, I don't know, I feel like if there's some way to help flip that for people um, to see mm. the, to see that and say, it's okay for me to watch something and get the little hairs up and, and maybe even cry and makes me want to do something. And it changes the stereotype. Whew, yeah. I'd love, I'd love the, um, the, the pill you could take for that to help people <laughs> do more of that if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've been fighting that fight since I was a news producer at a small CBS affiliate trying to bring good news instead of all the, the, the terrible stuff. So yeah. I'm with you, Billy. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. <laughs> it is. Well, yeah. and, and I like what you said about, you know, it's not, it's not just racism is what it sounds like. It's bias. It's judgment. Mm-hmm. And the idea to me is if we can humanize other people rather than dehumanize, that's where the storytelling comes in. If I can tell that story that gives, that makes your hair stand up, that brings that lump in your throat. If I can share that in some way, we're humanizing each other. Yeah. And man, it's hard to, it's hard to hate when you're right in somebody's face and you're hearing the story of something positive, isn't it? Absolutely. Or yeah. you just find something in common, yeah. right? How many times is it just the barrier and you don't ask that next question? It's like, eh, I don't want to get to know you. Right. Like, or, right. And, and it's just that, yeah. what, you like, you know, you like malts too, right? you like, <laughs> are you a chocolate freak too? Really? What kind of chocolate, right? Yeah. Um, so, right, it's like, it's just humanizing in a really basic way. I think it definitely starts there. But let's be real too. I think there's such, um, there's so many inequities. Like the, the playing field is not equal for everybody. Yeah. And going back to geography and what you were talking about, like where we are, you know, we're at the heart of Silicon Valley here. Uh, I, you know, it's like, oh yeah, San Francisco, y'all are rich there. You've taken over the planet. You got like all the crazy dot coms there. But you know, the young people that we're working with, even under the nose in this epicenter, right? They're not the kids with um, the same kind of access. Um, they're not the ones necessarily showing up with the smartphones. They don't have computers at home. We're, we're like in Silicon Valley. It's like, how is that possible? Oh, man, that's crazy. You know? Um, so there's some place in there where the economic barriers become, you know, these these barriers to access and opportunity. And and at some level, we got to keep it real because it's like the people who are affected are those who tend to be African American or Latino or people of color. Um, you know, the workforce is now looking at how many women are really in leadership positions. So these are important, you know, real stats and real data to be looking at to say, okay, let's be real also about the responsibility we have to just like look at what, what can we control or what can we do to help evil, you know, even out the playing field or create greater access, but even more so make sure that people without access have the access and can be on the same footing, like really start in the same place. Um, and, and that's like, to me, the, you know, our goal which is as we're, as we're launching the careers of these young people and we've got them working now at Pixar or Lucasfilm or, you know, Wired, for, for many of them, wow. it might, they still might be like one of the few kids of color, or I shouldn't call them kids at this point. These are young adults, <laughs> you know, working in the field and they still might be the only woman in a, in a, in a broadcast team or, um, you know, working in a creative light, um, in, in a creative, um, you know, um, career. And, and I think it's important that they, again, have that place to go to, to say, you know, this was a crappy day because I was in this room, I presented an idea and somebody else took it. And, you know, he was a guy and he decided to take it and all of a sudden he was heard, right? That stuff happens. (laughs) It unfortunately happens. So like, what can we do about that? Um, You know, or um, any of these things where race and gender and, and these kind of the bad, the, the, the hard stereotypes are still being used 
in a way that whether it's unconscious or conscious to like further business. And, and it's definitely something I feel like what we want to do and what we are doing is changing the whole ecosystem mm. because it's not just about serving the kids or those without access. You gotta, you gotta look at the whole ecosystem. Who are all the stakeholders that make somebody employable that, you know, just as an example. And so for us, it's not just about the young people that we serve. It's about teaching their parents, Hey, your kid could work at Pixar someday, but here's what it, what it's going to take. It's not going to be an easy road. Um, but here's what you got to be thinking about, right? Here's how you could get through and maybe help your young person get into the best high school. So therefore it could get them into the best college or post-secondary. You don't want to do college. That's cool, right? Here's what you could do to also get great credentials and get into the field. Um, as an employer, what are you doing to support young people who don't have the same access? Mm. You know, we have that conversation with them. Just as we mentor the young interns who are graduates, we stay in touch with our people. So the strength of that like alumni network is not just about the kids. It's really about like employers showing, hey, we've got some best practices and we've got this kid, Iman, who, who I talked about um, at the TED Talk. Yeah. Guess what? He won his first Emmy. It Did happened. he win it? He won. <laughs> That's awesome. Right? And so, like, talk about the ripple effect, right? Man, Iman, when they talk about, I want 100 Imans, I'm like, okay, this kid actually is the model for all these kids, <laughs> right? That's the positive representation. So, but that can't happen without changing the ecosystem. That means talking to the employers, talking to funders, talking to, you know, um, the corporate, the corporate, um, you know, sponsors, all these mm -hmm. people, um, the city and county of San Francisco, right? All these people have to be part of that conversation at the end. And that's what we get to do. Oh, absolutely. And, and it sounds like too, I mean, obviously you, you focus on video and you're talking about, you know, Pixar and Lucas films and, you know, like the giants is where Iman was for a while um, as a, as a videographer. But to me, it's probably not just media. What you said a minute ago about helping the, the family understand, the parents understand, you can use this to get into the better high schools. You can use storytelling, mm -hmm. I would guess on your resume, whatever it is. So you don't like, you don't have to go into the media world. You can use no. storytelling for anything. Absolutely. And, That's I, awesome. and I, I always say that it's like not every kid that goes through Bay Cat is going to be a filmmaker or a media maker, but it's just even engaging in your own story and knowing that you matter it gives you a, a certain sense of, you know, empowerment. Like you literally see these kids start the day and they, they don't even want to say their name. They're not even looking up. And by the time we hit the world premiere, they're announcing, they're like, you know, hi, I'm Billy. I'm 16 and I'm the director of a, you know, of a film. All of a sudden it's like, the body language changes. They could do anything they want from that moment. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a huge, it's a, it's a, just a huge way to engage young people and say, Hey, you do matter. You could go do anything you want, but you know, the reality is the other side, which is like, we can say that and pat them on the back and trust me, people have done that, but we also keep it real. It's not, it's not a fair playing field. It's not necessarily level or equal. So how can we build, you know, greater equity into the workplace or along this pathway? So people that we work with definitely need more support in different ways, you know, and that goes back to like looking at the whole ecosystem together. Um, cause, cause it kind of goes back to what you were saying. It's also like, it's not just like, it's not the, it's not just the, a white person's, you know, message, but to the extent you got to look at who's in power and who are the ones that are controlling you know, ultimately how decisions are made, how money is spent, how the recruitment is happening, all those kinds of things, they all matter, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so for us too, I think what's super interesting is also like where corporate social responsibility these days intersects story, right? And intersects like how a company brands themselves. It's something that we look at because the studio side of what we do like we, we just got to do, uh, we work really closely with the Golden State Warriors champions. <laughs> Sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> that's all right. I don't, that's all right. I'm a, I'm a hockey guy. So you're, okay, you're, okay. that's all right. Safe We're good. Basketball. <laughs> um, yeah. But like, you know, we got to produce Black History Month and Women's History Month themes for them. And those mm. put out all over their social media. And we got to engage community and our young people, right, in authentic ways. Um, I don't normally, we don't normally like hire teenagers to do that, but 
the stars of the Black History Month video were Angela and Isaiah, and they are both uh, 16, year olds, 16 years old now, and they started at Baycat, Angela started at 11, and Isaiah started at 12, wow. you know? So we knew they were great music producers, and we pitched the idea to the Warriors. And going back to like community, right? They could have said, oh yeah, like for commercial reasons, kids sell, let's do that, right? I wouldn't have done that if that's who they were or what their intentions are. They're not that. These are really, um, they're great people who believe in community. And part of the community story we want to tell around Black History Month came literally from the stories that our young people and the black community that we work with told us, this is why we're proud to be African-American here in the Bay Area. And, we, and the kids helped to write the song, do the beats, but we produced this as a professional studio. It only works if the, the people that we're working with have the same intention of like shining a light in a positive way to community. Like we've got to be, that corporate social responsibility has got to be like-minded, you know? So we don't get to do that. We don't do that with everybody. Like we want to make sure, um, you know, the companies that we work with really are intentional and authentic. Again, going back to authenticity about mm -hmm. why they want to do that. But at the same time, it's good business, right? So we, they hire us to tell this authentic story that ends up, you know, blowing up in, 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 in a really good way. Like it brought even much more visibility to them not just in the African-American community. I was in Taiwan and people saw it, right? Oh, wow. And I was just mm. like, what? They happen to be warrior fans. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes back to the power of story, right? It goes back mm -hmm. to that power. It's like, that's pretty cool. Um, but again, it comes with like an ecosystem of partners who like agree and want to do the same thing. Yeah. And, and out of all the different mediums that are available, you've chosen video and it sounds like, I mean, it's obviously powerful. Why video for Baycat? Why not teach them how to write or something different? What, what drew you to video as a storyteller? Yeah, mainly, you know, a little bit of what I was saying before, not seeing yourself represented in media. And now that, that the ability to do this, like we could talk to each other and post it on YouTube. There's just like a barrage of tools that are out there to get your story out um, I still think we need a lot of work on getting good stories out, but that's, mm. you and I need to work on that, Dan. Um, I'm, but, I'm in. Uh, uh, but I, I feel like, you know, video, especially when it comes to stories around race, when it's about visually, like how you see somebody, um, you know, media, media in the form of video is extra powerful because you actually see. It's also like, it's great when you break stereotypes, even of, of the age when you see some of our kids work, you're like, what, a teenager did that, right? Or like, you know, we're a nonprofit social enterprise. And if I introduce ourselves as a nonprofit, all it, automatically I say, hey, you could hire me, right? I show them the work and they're like, oh man, this is good. Like, whoa, what happened? Like, <laughs> Why are you shocked? <laughs> right, right, do nonprofits yeah. suck? Like, you know, yeah, I know it always seems like we're poor or we're a charity, right? That, that's exactly going back to like breaking the image. Like to me, video was the powerhouse that allowed us to actually show, literally show that off um, even more so than just like to have people listen to it, right? Um, so we, we, as we do the videos, obviously also in video and storytelling, there's definitely still the writing component you know, the music component. It's like those other components that lend themselves to video. I just felt like it was one of the most comprehensive because it's such, the visual medium is so important. So we actually also teach graphic arts and animation, music production and music video production, partly because the kids, um, you know, how else do we, how else are going back to sound? Um, so maybe not the, the spoken word, there's definitely that. But audio wise, music is another, you know, either perpetuator of positive story or not. So music is a big one for our young people because they, you know, they're always um, plugged in mm -hmm. uh, as, as many adults are now. Um, so music is also a big form. And of course, music videos, um, even our young people have analyzed how some music videos, that genre is changing very quickly and whether it breaks stereotypes. Um, or, you know, maybe blows your mind and how it approaches some of the 
uh, look at, I, I won't mention names, but like some of the trending amazing music videos that are out there, really pushing some buttons um, to hopefully, again, stir a conversation that needs to be had. Um, yeah. But talk about powerful. It's again, a, a music meets the visual, which you can't forget, right? Those, those images kind of stay in your mind. Oh, it's very powerful. Do yeah. you, do you also kind of see video has become not so I'm going to say it this way. I see video as a relatively um, when, when done inexpensively can be a relatively low barrier to entry for a lot of folks. I mean, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the, the kids coming in, the young people coming in may not have smartphones, but I also know that like smartphones are, are so prevalent. Mm -hmm. If you have a smartphone and you can set up a free YouTube account, you're all yep. of a sudden a video creator. Yep. Is that helpful too, to, to the, the, the folks you're serving? Yeah, it's definitely to show that anybody can have the access and the tools to have something published. Um, but you know, also what we're trying to teach them is to the extent you're really into this, and you want to be employed, your story better be good. You, you need to learn how to be a storyteller, right? Because now anybody could, you can make a movie, anybody can make a movie on their cell phone, but then it becomes, you know, is it a good story? <laughs> right. 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 Um, what is your story? What is your story trying to say? What is it? Um, is there a beginning, middle and end? Is there an end, right? Um, all those questions of just like the true art of storytelling, I feel like is something it's one of those skill sets. And of course, like when you look at, um, there's so many, there's so much uh, data about the 21st century skills. And as the AI, you know, keeps replacing all the basic skills and many that are left brained that we as a society, what, what can't be replaceable is really the creative and innovative sides of us. Yeah. Um, and how much of story is all about that, right? It's like really, it's a very reflective process. It's one that you have to, you could, you know, to the extent it's, it's a narrative and it's based on true facts or not, but you've got to invent and create and make it make sense somehow. Mm -hmm. And to me, those skill sets are what, what we teach because it also prepares our young people to be in the workforce for the 21st century and hopefully beyond, right? Um, yeah. it, it is where I feel like the superhuman brains this is, this is the stuff that computers can't quite replace, yeah. right? So tool-wise, I think, you know, Baycat's going to be 14 years now, and we've seen the tools change. So we've adapted as we've gone along, and fortunately, things have gotten less expensive with, like, the invention of smartphones, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's like the art of the storytelling or teaching young people that that part of you that's authentic, that's truly you, or your opinion that comes into that story, that's what really matters. And, um, you know, we've been really fostering that side of it, no matter what the tool is. It's like yeah. that, that's one of those things I feel like they don't quite teach enough at school. Um, it's more than just an essay, right? Because it does get into that back end of like who you really are and why your story matters um, that we, we, we tend to accent here. Yeah, I love that you keep going back to why the story, why your story matters. That's so yeah. important. How do yeah. you think, how, how can listeners of the Storytellers Network, people that I would consider probably, you know, affluent listeners, so to speak, right, um, compared to a lot of the world around us, how can those listeners who want to be storytellers help you, help Baycat, help the people around us maybe, um, those stories that aren't being told, how can we help those stories get out there? Yeah, well, a, a lot of different ways. Definitely like tune in and, and listen you know, and watch, right? So Baycat, um, our youth, all the youth, we're up to episode 40 um, of shows that they've created. Um, and so this summer, they're going to premiere number 40. Um, each one has a topic and it's on our Baycat YouTube station, um, which is Baycat 05. So check it out, check out their work. And I would say, you know, not only watch it, but share it. And maybe if you're watching it, what personal story does it bring out for you? You know, when you, when you watch it, what does it make you think of? Or did it make you laugh? Like what kind of reaction did it give you? And so more than sharing it, it'd be great to like have people talk about it. You know, if they're using social media uh, or whatever that might look like. We've, we've often, if you're in the corporate sector, you know, um, I, there's a lot of like people having conversations, whether it's with guest speakers and panels over brown bag lunches. I'd be happy to come. I know we've had our young people come. 
uh, whatever that looks like. So it's almost like a festival feeling, right? You could get the story behind the story. What made a filmmaker make something like this or mm -hmm. what's behind the scenes? Cause that's always super interesting. The story behind the story. Oh yeah. So, you know, if there's an opportunity to, to share a story there live, um, uh, through a, a company or whatever that might look like, that would be great. We, we really welcome our corporate partnerships and foundations. Um, if I was a for-profit company, I'd be saying, you know, I can't raise money fast enough. I need my next level of angel investors to really scale the storytelling model. Um, so we're right at that place as we turn 15 next year to say we've been visited by people all over the world um, from Asia, I've been in um, Ethiopia with a bunch of kids, um, in Europe, uh, also across the nation. So we know we have a model that people are interested in. And, and honestly, Dan, I can't raise money fast enough to not only like figure out how to take care of scaling or, fi or like scaling our model, but also last year we actually turned away over 200 young people. So the demand is so heavy. Um, and so part of what we're doing is growing up like any other great organization, which is looking for really great people who love what we do. And to the extent people want to get involved, you know, you could, you could write me an email. Um, and, and I don't know if you, I'm sure you'll publish all the information. So mm -hmm. I welcome that. Um, in addition to like, you know, um, sending us a note, letting us know how you want to support. Cause we are really at that place where we'd love to bring more storytellers into the world, you know, and mm -hmm. whether you're creating it or helping the create that ripple effect and that system to be the, the vessel for all these stories. We need that. You know, we need the people who are the like-minded folks in your network. So, yeah. Well, I'll definitely put all the links in the, in the show notes. How do you think yeah. um, if, if I'm a storyteller, so I'm in, outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan in a small town and then, and they're half, there has to be stories around me that aren't being told people yeah. who feel invisible. Yeah. How easy is it? Or can I just reach out to folks and say, I want to tell your story. I mean, does that, does that, do you think that gets awkward? Or do you think that's something that I can actually, or, or again, the listeners, whatever town you're in, wherever you are, whatever your network, your, your sphere of influence. Um, yeah. I mean, how does it look to, to reach out to folks and say, I want to help people tell their story? Yeah, I think, you know, people who love our, our love this idea, I, I basically am the you, right? And saying, hey, I want to figure out how to do this. You know, it, 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 of course, it could be awkward, right? Like, hi, I just met you. I want, I want to hear your story. Um, again, I think it has to be authentic, you know, yeah. and you have to build trust. And, and it's like, to what end? Like, am I, are you going to make money off of my story? Like, how many stories are being argued about or like being sold? Right. So there's kind of that, that money side of it, the economic side of it, that I feel like you just got to be real about what this is, you know, as a studio, when, when clients, when we hire clients, we're very real about every dollar is helping this entire model. Right. So I think any person going out there, of course, if you're eager to find out people's stories, there's, you've got to be your authentic self of how that comes across yeah. and ultimately where it goes. Because I think the flip side of that too, Dan, in our world of privacy is, okay, so where the heck is this going to go? And like, who's going to see it? And how's that going to maybe kick me, right, in some way? Um, I, I think, but for me being on a TED stage, like, man, you're kidding me, right? I'm going to give a TED talk about racism <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, basically talk about like my own racism. That's like, I don't think I would have done that if it wasn't for... Uh, you know, a platform that I trusted, right? There's got to be some connection to ultimately that level of broadcast. Mm -hmm. But I do love your intention, Dan, because I do feel like if we were as humans more curious about each other, and instead of like, you know, trying to fix somebody or, you know, let me find out about you. Let, like, let's share a story. Let's find a commonality. I, I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I just want to get to know you. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get a date. I'm not trying to like, right. <laughs> it's like, there's always like the, uh, 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 what, what are you after? Mm -hmm. Like, I think to the extent we could really honestly share stories and, 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 and build that kind of empathy um, for each other through stories that, that certainly would make the world look a lot better than it is now. 
wouldn't it? Just a <laughs> little more empathy, a little more fireside chats. Yeah, not even necessarily to to publish it and share it. Just exactly. sit down over a cup a cup of tea or something, right? A cup yeah, of coffee, I, a beer. Like, no, I'm not gonna try to post it. It's just <clears> throat> like throat> it's a moment. Um, I kind of, I feel like we're losing that part of ourselves a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, cool. you know, yeah. So uh, I want to hear, uh, I could sit here and talk to you all day long, Billy. I know you got 32 <laughs> kids out there waiting for you and things to do. So no, no. I won't do that to us or the listeners. Um, <laughs> about an hour is probably my attention span. So, but, but I do like to, to find out though, if you could tell only one last story and that was it and you were done telling stories what story would that be for you what would that look like oh my god dan that's a really hard question it's my favorite (laughs) if i could tell one last story like and then i'm kaput and that's it yeah now i I will say this billy you said earlier we're all natural storytellers so probably you'd never be done (laughs) but if for some reason yeah, you could no you could no longer tell stories as a storyteller. What would that be? Wow. Well, I don't know. That's a, that's a really hard one because it's like my mind is filled with stories for sure. Um, I, and I keep thinking about like maybe maybe can I do like a story wish? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like done. I think I think my story wish as we create this whole new era of storytellers is that, um, you know, it's kind of like seeing these Bay Cat young people, storytellers grow up and as they are able to tell their own stories is, you know, my storytellers wish would be like, it truly creates a ripple effect that more of these beautiful authentic stories are told uh, and that our world does get better, you know? And, And I think it does come from not fighting each other around these, important topics, but really um, finding the commonality and finding common solutions together. I really believe that can happen. So uh, without putting myself on the spot and trying to think of one last story, that would be my storyteller's wish. How's that? That's perfect. <laughs> and, and that would go such a long way to ending racism one story at a time. So oh my God. Like, perfect I, way to wrap it. Yeah. I want the, I want the stories to to be able to replicate and multi- multiply at a at an exponential rate so mm-hmm. that we could get to a better place. Now, yeah. I'm impatient. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm with I love it. Well, Billy, thank you so much for taking time to tell your story and the story of Baycat, uh, sharing that story with the listeners. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing, Dan. It's my pleasure. What's the easiest way for the listeners to, to find you? Yeah, so find Baycat at um, baycat.org, www.baycat.org. Um, you could get me on Twitter. You could get me on LinkedIn. That's probably like the easiest. Um, and if you want to shoot me an email, you could definitely um, do it through the Baycat website um, or you just like Billy Wong at baycat.org. So it's pretty simple. Excellent. Well, Billy Wong, it's been an absolute pleasure. You are more than a king uh, or a queen or however it translates exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, I thank, thank you. you so much for sharing. No, I appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. My gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Billy, for joining us today. It's so, so much appreciate you sharing your story and Baycat's story and the stories of these uh, young people just making huge waves in the world. So, so thank you again to our guest, Billy Wong. Be sure to visit her online. You can find all those links in the show notes. Uh, definitely check out Baycat and check out some of the videos. They are amazing. And, so, and watch that TED Talk. I'm telling you right now, um, I ended up watching it uh, just before our talk and I came into it all emotional and like just ready to cry because uh, she is such a great storyteller. So Billy, you are awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, if you enjoyed our episode, consider sharing it all over the place. As Billy said, the key here is to sharing uh, great stories and positivity out there in the world. So get on Facebook, share a story, uh, share this on Twitter, on LinkedIn, wherever you want to share. I really appreciate it. Uh, and also what helps is leaving reviews. So of course, you know, in the world of podcasts, uh, reviews are huge. So uh, on Apple Podcasts, if you want to go there and, and click the write a review, leave a, a rating if you enjoyed it. And uh, and if you didn't, then don't. <laughs> but, uh, but no, if you, I know I'm full of bad jokes. I'm sorry. I laugh at my own stuff. Anyway, uh, if you enjoyed it, leave, leave a review there. Just something short, sweet. I really do appreciate it. Uh, that helps helps us to reach new storytellers. In fact, uh, Wally Carmichael, host of Men of Abundance podcast, another great place, by the way, to go find amazing stories, uh, left a review early on 
uh, in this journey. He ended up being a guest eventually too, uh, while well, he's just a good dude. And he said, I'm a sucker for great stories. I like what I'm hearing so far on the Storytellers Network. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to put this together. I really dig your story. That's so cool, man. Thank you, Wally, for the kind words. Mahalo. And hey, thank you for listening or for watching on YouTube. Uh, thanks for being around here and sticking around. I appreciate it very much. Until next time, here's to telling our stories, having stories to tell. Cheers. Cheers.